and we are recording. Welcome everybody to the first of our review sessions for the final exam. So I'm recording this live and leaving room for questions for those who are comfortable having their questions um, be recorded. And this is essentially a live review presentation. Um, this lecture is going to outline the format of the final and I'm also going to recap a number of the most important topics from the lectures that we had before the midterm. There will be a review session on Wednesday, June 2nd, next week, that will cover the post midterm material in more depth. Um, and this class is quite broad, as I'm sure you've all realized. That's one fun thing about this class, but also a bit of a challenge because we cover so much ground. And I hope that this review session, aside from refreshing you on what you've learned, might also help you spot some connections um, between different units of our class, or at least help solidify some connections between, say, when we learned about climate and then when we learned about climate change later on or um, when we learned about ecology early on and then more recently we've learned about the effects of climate change on Antarctic ecosystems. Um, so hopefully this will help seem the overall scope of this class appear to be a bit less random. I have a few announcements first. We are approaching the end of the term um, and we have just a few more upcoming assignments. Reading assignment number two is due this Sunday, May 30th at 1159 PM. And the final lab on Antarctic climate records is due this Friday, Friday, May 28th at 1159 PM. I wanted to mention that if you're looking to submit extra credit assignments, please turn those into me by Sunday, June 6th at 1159 PM. That is the Sunday before finals week. Um, so today, lecture 18, I'll be, pre I'll be recording this um, about this is going to be a summary of the material that we learned before the midterm. And then on Monday, May 31st, there will not be office hours and I will not release a lecture that day because it is Memorial Day and UCSB honors Memorial Day as a holiday. So the next and final lecture will be recorded on Wednesday, June 2nd at two o'clock PM during regular office hours. Um, and that lecture, lecture 19, will more closely cover the material since the midterm. The final exam is going to be open all of finals week. It will open on Monday, June 7th at midnight, and it will stay open until Friday, June 11th at 1159 PM. So I do that so that you can sort of fit this exam in with your other exams, because it's not that crucial, I think, that you sit down at a particular time to do this. Um, but make sure that you take it within that window, because I don't have a lot of flexibility with the final exam. Grades will be due very soon after finals week. The last thing I wanted to mention is that there is another colloquium happening Thursday at two o'clock PM for those interested in doing an extra credit write-up. And we have two of our grad students at UCSB talking about their research. We have Kelly Tingle talking about um, fossils from the Grand Canyon, which is really cool. Um, and then we also have Mary Ringwood talking about how sediments are subducted. And that's something that I touched on a little bit when you learned about subduction. And it's also something I talked a little bit about when we learned about the carbon cycle because seafloor carbonates get subducted. And um, sediments being subducted into the mantle actually has a role in changing the composition of the mantle. But that's sort of outside the scope of this class. But um, these talks are worth attending if you want to learn about some of the research going on and if you want to write an extra credit write up. And again, regarding reading assignment number two, it's about a scientific journal article. You're looking for an article that is detailing research and written by the scientists themselves or by the people studying history or social science themselves, because I'm open to you using peer reviewed history articles or social science articles about Antarctica, because we do touch a fair bit on the human history of Antarctica and human interactions with Antarctica. This isn't a strictly purely science class, although it's mostly, although it fills a physical science requirement and that's the main focus of most of the units of this class. Um, I recommend using the UCSB library online system, using the databases in there to look for articles. You can use Google, just make sure that you're, what you find on Google is being published by um, an academic journal that is peer reviewed. Um, if you look at the website for the academic journal itself, whether that's Nature or um, GSA publications, like the Geological Society of America publishes things or um, whatever journal it is, you can go to their about and they will say, they have to say somewhere there 
whether the articles put out in this publication have been looked over and checked for facts and for possible inaccuracies by people in that field of study, but people who were not necessarily directly involved in the article. Um, so it's the idea is that it's a an outside fact check written by people who who at least should not have a conflict of interest or have vested interests in the article that was written. And you need to, so this is going to be very similar in format to our assignment number one. You need to write greater than 400 words. It's about one page and please upload it into Gaucho Space. Um, the, you can write about anything, but you need to address what the research goals of the authors were, what their results were and why that's important, whether that's, and that can be, and if, if it seems like it's just important in the scope of say, studies of musical connections to Antarctica or studies of midges in Antarctica, well, even if it's something that maybe the general public wouldn't necessarily be all that invested in, the people writing the article should still somewhere say why they why they published this study and why this why it was important for them to do this study. Um, if you're having a lot of trouble finding that, then you might want to pick a different article. Um, and then you want to also address what um, if the results were what the authors were expecting, because they should somewhere indicate what they expected to find or what they what they thought they might find. They sh they, there should be a hypothesis somewhere that indicates what they thought they would find, and they should address whether that was actually what they found or not. Um, I also have some, so this assignment is going to be due on Sunday, May 30th um, at 11.59 p.m. That is this Sunday, that is the Sunday before Dead Week. Um, also, Richard, one of the TAs, has some words of wisdom. He says that the most important step is to, to identifying what a journal article looks like and picking one that you understand well enough to write about. Um, a peer-reviewed article is going to have an abstract to start with and end with a conclusion, and there will be other sections on methods, results, and discussion as needed. Pages are going to be, the, excuse me, the articles are going to be between five pages and 30 pages. You do not need to pick a long article. Um, and the writing style is typically going to be aimed at specialists in the field, um, which is one reason why these articles can be a bit more challenging. The news story try the news stories try to make dense science more digestible for a wider variety of people. Um, and the we don't expect you to have a complete, absolute understanding of all of the articles because you aren't necessarily specialists in studying ice cores or studying midges. I mean, there's a very good chance you aren't just yet. If you are, that's extremely impressive. Um, and please tell me because I'd love your input. But this is an exercise meant to introduce you to a format used to spread scientific knowledge and to give you practice with identifying key pieces of information and sharing your analysis. So hit the key requirements given in the instructions and you'll be fine. Don't pick too long an article and don't pick one that's really challenging. We're not looking for you to write, we're not, we're not looking for you to write about something really dense and to impress us. Pick something that you like and that you understand. Um, also be just careful about making vague statements and um, try to be precise with what you're writing. Um, if you have trouble understanding an article, feel free to email one of the TAs or us or me. But again, if the article is completely unintelligible to you, then I would suggest picking something else. Any questions about reading assignment number two before I move on? So that is due this Sunday. Now for the final exam, um, the final exam will be open from Monday, June 7th until Friday, June 11th. It's going to be very similar to the midterm in that it will consist of 50 multiple choice questions um, with some true or false mixed in as well. So 50 questions total, they're all going to be either multiple choice with a handful of true or false. There will be 10 questions on each page of the Gaucho Space Quiz and you can go back to your previously answered questions and change your answers before you submit. Just make sure that you answer every question before you do submit. And you'll have 75 minutes to complete it. You may begin your attempt at any time within the window I gave within finals week but you only get a single attempt. So I again suggest that you not wait until the last minute and try to find a time when you can be as free of distractions as you can. And if the internet is misbehaving, try to take it at a different time. If the internet um, is acting up in the middle of your exam, then let me know right away. And I can see what sort of plan we can figure out. 
this will be a closed book, closed notes exam. So don't look at the slides, don't look at your notes, and don't talk to your friends. And today will be a review session. There's not a lot of slides in this session. I'll have a slide for each overall unit of the class with key concepts. And then I've um, also added some potential questions that could show up on the final related to material that we learned before the midterm. So the final exam is indeed cumulative, but it's more heavily weighted towards material that we've learned after the midterm. 75% of the questions will be on the concepts covered um, in lectures 11 through 17 and the videos and readings that you've done since the midterm. Now, regarding the videos and readings, if you've read them once and taken some notes, and if you've seen all of the video clips I've told you to watch, then you are good. There's not going to be a lot of detailed questions about those. Those are meant to reinforce concepts. So don't spend, unless you have lots of time or you really want to, don't feel, don't feel like you have to rewatch all the videos or read the articles that I've assigned over and over again at the expense of going over the lecture material. But go ahead and watch them and read them if you haven't already done so. And I will be putting out a study guide with key terms for the post midterm lectures in the next couple of days. And I'll include a list also of terms from the midterm study guide that are likely to show up on the final exam. So about one out of four questions on the final will relate to material or to concepts from the pre midterm material. And I am not asking you to study or review any of the videos or articles that I assigned you before the midterm only the lecture slides. So you will definitely want to review the lecture slides from earlier in the course, but if you did see all of the article, excuse me, if you did see all of the videos that I assigned or read all of the articles that were for the weeks before the midterm, then you are fine and I'm not going to be testing you on those at all. Um, so this is what we covered before the midterm, if you remember. We started with geography, went on to climate and atmospheric and oceanic circulation. Then we talked about geology and plate tectonics. We learned about different um, types of plate boundaries and then went on to talk about fossils and paleontology before going into a broad overview of the geologic history of Antarctica, where we touched on events like Snowball Earth, the Antarctic coal swamps, the abundance of Antarctic dinosaurs, and the opening of gateways and the beginning of modern Antarctica when the Antarctic circumpolar current opened up. We went on from we led straight from that into talking about what sparse terrestrial wildlife is still in Antarctica. And then in lecture eight, we had a, an overview of Antarctic marine ecology. So this is what we learned before the midterm. Does anybody have any clarifying questions before I go over some of the specific points that are likely to show up again? So going back to lecture two on geography, we learned about how Antarctica is the coldest, driest, windiest, and highest continent, at least on average. And you wanna remember that there are some of these extremes that are only applicable for averages. Asia has the highest point on earth. Mount Everest is in Asia um, on the boundary between Tibet and India. But on average, Antarctica is higher than Asia because the ice sheets are so high up and that overall averages the height of Antarctica to be, well, really high. Antarctica doesn't have a lot of, um, it doesn't have a lot of low-lying plains like Asia does, which sort of cancel out the high points from the Tibetan Plateau and the Himalaya. And now by this point in the class, you should know why you have the ice sheets in Antarctica because of Antarctica's latitude and the tilt of Earth's axis, as well as the effects of oceanic and atmospheric circulation, Antarctica is a cold, dry, and borderline uninhabitable continent. In the geography unit, we talked about latitude and longitude, as well as how maps are drawn and some important geographic features in Antarctica, like the difference between East and West Antarctica and the two separate ice sheets, as well as the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, which divide them. And those mountains are a legacy of the rifting that separated Antarctica from other continents. It's one of the rift shoulders formed when a mid-ocean ridge formed between um, Antarctica and the rest of Gondwana. We talked about the difference between the geographic South Pole, the southernmost point on Earth, and the magnetic South Pole, which is where Earth's magnetic field comes out on the bottom of the Earth, and the magnetic pole actually wanders over time, whereas the South geographic pole is 
fixed. You don't get any more south than the geographic pole, but the magnetic south pole does wander. Um, and the you want to I tr I've tried to write the slides in this session to connect concepts. For example, the Antarctic circumpolar current comes up a bunch throughout the course, um, and I've mentioned it here. Um, we learned a little bit about the human geography in lecture two. You will want to be familiar with the United States bases and where they are. And the question I threw in here is one that uses a hint related to the post midterm material to emphasize a concept from before the midterm. So. The question is, the Belgian Antarctic expedition was the first expedition to overwinter south of the Antarctic Circle. And the question is, the Antarctic Circle is what kind of line? A line of longitude, a contour line, an equilibrium line, a line of latitude, or a thermohaline line? And in this case, the correct answer would be, um, the correct answer would be D, because latitude tells you how north or south you are. The Antarctic Circle defines the Antarctic Circle defines what is south of it. South of the Antarctic Circle, everything experiences at least one 24-hour period of darkness per year, as well as at least one 24-hour period of constant sunlight. And this is just an example of how a term that I introduced from before the midterm came up later in the course, and I use a hint related to history of Antarctica to emphasize a concept related directly to geography. Um, you have to remember that longitude lines, um, they're vertical and they tell you distance east or west. The Antarctic Circle doesn't have it. The Antarctic Circle is a line that tells you how south you are. Um, contour lines relate to topographic maps and how they show elevation and landforms like mountains. Equilibrium lines are something I touched on during the glaciers unit. They represent the boundary between the zone of accumulation and the zone of ablation, or where the glacier is melting and going away. And then thermohaline circulation, thermohaline lines aren't really a thing. Thermohaline circulation is a thing. We learned about that during ocean circulation, but that's something you should be able to rule out quickly enough because that's not directly related to this. So geography questions. Going on to climate now, climate began with a fair bit of intro material. Um, we learned about solar radiation, the greenhouse effect, and the structure of the atmosphere. And we managed to delve into some Antarctica specific concepts like the ozone layer and the Antarctic ozone hole. Um, so we talked about how we talked about how CFCs and nitric oxide are destroying ozone, how polar stratospheric polar stratospheric clouds made of nitric acid trihydrate. Um, especially cause ozone destruction when that compound is trapped in Antarctica by the polar vortex during the winter. We learned about how the southern lights form in the thermosphere from, in, in, from an interaction between Earth's magnetic field and charged solar particles. And we then moved on to a discussion of why Antarctica is so cold. The high latitudes mean that sunlight reaches Antarctica not very directly. And then you have the fact that Earth's axis is tilted which causes Antarctica to face away from the sun and be in darkness for much of the year. You want to be able to understand how an excess of solar radiation and thus an excess of energy at the equator leads to atmospheric circulation. And while atmospheric circulation cells may not immediately take air in a direct loop from the equator to the poles, the ultimate effect is that the three cells bring some of the solar energy to the poles. You want to understand what high versus low pressure is, um, how Antarctica, as well as the North Pole, is a zone of high pressure because you have air falling from one of these cells. And that air is quite dry because it will have lost most of its moisture as the air rose and cooled at 60 degrees north or 60 degrees south. The high pressure also contributes to Antarctica being so windy. You have the air falling, and then you also have the dome shape of the glaciers producing these strong winds known as catabatic or pressure winds that blow from the center of the continent. Um, and we also talked about ocean circulation, how wind 
causes surface oceans currents like the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and how Ekman transport can cause winds blowing from the north to create a current that overall goes from west to east around the continent. And the Southern Ocean being open all around the continent, being kind of an unbroken loop about around the continent, both allows the Antarctic Circumpolar Current to make a loop around the continent, and it also allows for strong winds. The Southern Ocean is extremely windy, and those winds are not really broken by any land. There's no land bridge between Antarctica and any other continents. The fact that Antarctica is isolated from other continents is really important. That's something, geologically speaking, that occurred pretty recently. So one place where you might expect to see connections with the post-midterm material here is climate change. And in lecture four, we talked about Antarctic bottom water, and we later went on in lecture, um, uh, let's see, that would have been lecture 18, 18, 17, this is 18, 17. Lecture 15, we talked a little bit about the consequences of sea ice loss and the warming of the oceans. So in this example, question here, the loss of sea ice is one um, possible consequence. So here, so the question is, what is a consequence of climate change that could slow or stop the formation of Antarctic bottom water? And the possibilities are salp population explosion, loss of sea ice, population decline of Adelie penguins, strengthening of winds, or the Antarctic ozone hole. And the clue here should be that Antarctic bottom water forms because of sea ice formation. The ocean water freezes, leaving behind whatever salt was in the water that is now frozen in the small remaining amount of liquid water. And that liquid water, which is now saltier and denser, sinks. If less sea ice forms, that has the potential to slow or stop the formation of Antarctic bottom water. So that is one direct connection. That's one place where something we learned about in the climate unit shows up again when we talk about climate change and how human-induced actions are changing the climate of Antarctica. The others won't really directly affect it. Um, a lot of the others are actually consequences of the sea ice loss. Salp, which are these those swimming sea squirts, their population is exploding because there is less sea ice. Adelie penguins are declining because there is less sea ice. Strengthening of winds, eh, doesn't really have much to do with it directly. The Antarctic ozone hole doesn't really have much to do with sea ice loss. So any climate related questions that you have before I move on to geology? Now moving on to geology, we learned about continental drift and then about plate tectonics. Um, we talked a bit about the structure of the earth and how it is how the surface of the earth consists of tectonic plates made of rigid lithosphere, the physical layer of the earth consisting of the crust and the uppermost part of the mantle. We went over how fossils, the shapes of continents, and evidence of glaciers and mountain belts indicated that continents had moved and how subsequently the discovery of seafloor spreading in which new crust is produced at mid-ocean ridges, as well as the discovery of subduction in which crust is recycled in trenches, these two discoveries allowed for a mechanism to be discovered that explained continental drift and allowed for the theory of plate tectonics to be developed. We talked a bit about how the cycle of ridge push and slab pull, as well as convection in the mantle, drive this process, and we learned about the three different types of plate boundaries, convergent, divergent, and transform boundaries, as well as some related features like fracture zones and hotspots. So the example question here isn't one that relates that closely to any of the post midterm material, but you want to be familiar with the different types of plate boundaries. So something like this could show up. And the question is, at what type of plate boundary is there no volcanism? At a divergent plate boundary, a convergent plate boundary that involves two oceanic plates, a convergent boundary that involves an oceanic plate and a continental plate colliding, a convergent boundary that involves two continents, or a hotspot? The answer is actually D, because continents do not subduct. That is something you have to remember. Continents are not dense enough to subduct, and if two continents collide, you get mountain building. You get 
you get the crust sort of rumpling up, but that doesn't cause any volcanoes. The mid-ocean ridge actually has volcanoes. The, the mid-ocean ridge is actually where lava is bubbling up and cooling into oceanic crust. That is volcanism. When you have two oceanic plates come together, that leads to subduction, which leads to volcanoes. Um, when you have an oceanic plate hitting a continental plate, the oceanic plate subducts and also makes volcanoes. And E is a little bit tricky because a hotspot is not technically a type of plate boundary, but there are volcanoes at hotspots. Hotspots are like the Hawaiian Islands and then Mount Erebus and Deception Island and Antarctica, which are known for being volcanoes. So if you are feeling a little bit rusty on the different types of plate boundaries, that is worth reviewing. And review the difference between oceanic and continental crust as well. Oceanic crust is thinner, denser, and it subducts. Continental crust is thicker and less dense, and it does not subduct. A consequence of this is that throughout geologic time, the percentage of continental crust versus oceanic crust on Earth has steadily increased. The size of the continents compared to the size of the area covered by oceans has increased over geologic time. So any questions about plate boundaries, continental drift, plate tectonics, or other aspects of intro geology? Could you really quickly explain again why the divergent causes it? Sorry, there's like a noise from the gardener outside if you hear that, but um, why divergent boundaries create volcan or volcanoes? Because I thought that was them like sliding past each those other. Those are those are transform boundaries. Uh, transform boundaries aren't on here. Transform boundaries are not one of the options here. Transform oh, okay. The transform boundaries are the ones that slide past each other. Divergent mm -hmm. boundaries are moving in opposite directions. And at the center where they're pulling apart, lava is welling up. And that right, is a form right. of volcano. So, okay, hopefully, so that ma hopefully that makes sense. And the, um, actually, you just said the word. Uh, the transform boundaries, they don't form volcanoes. That is correct. So. Okay. It, so, I think that's that's what I was thinking when I read Divergent. Yep, not a problem. Glad to clarify that. Any other questions? And I couldn't hear too much background noise, so you're fine, actually. Don't worry about that. Okay, thank you. Yep. So we went from geology into talking a little bit about fossil history. So we learned about different types of fossils um, and paleont and we learned about paleontology. I covered how you have relative dating, where you compare the placement of different rock layers as well as structures in those rock layers, and then how you also have absolute dating, where you use radioactive isotopes to come up with a number for how long ago that rock was formed. And that's usually most useful for igneous rocks, rocks formed from volcanoes or from magma in general. And we study fossils to study the rock record and fossils actually help us a lot with relative dating because um, relative dating is most relative dating um, sedimentary rocks those rocks formed from sand or mud or other sediments cannot easily be absolutely dated those are also the rocks that contain fossils usually and we can actually look at the presence or absence of fossils and layers of rock to correlate them to figure out whether rocks found in different areas are of a similar origin or whether they're the same. That's one way in which continental drift was studied. The fossils of, say, Lystrosaurus, the animal that was found both in Antarctica and South Africa and India, they found them, they found those fossils in similar types of rock on the three continents. So you can either, we learned about how you can either have body fossils where you have part of the organism itself or trace fossils that leave behind part of something an organism does, like a burrow or a stromatolite, the structures built by cyanobacteria, or a footprint. When we went into the geologic history of Antarctica, it was kind of like a highlights reel. A, most of the geologic history of life is preserved in Antarctica somewhere. Antarctica has been, has existed for a long time. East Antarctica contains rock that has been in place since 3.8 billion years ago. And that is known as a craton, a piece of continent that has been largely intact since the, since the beginning of plate tectonics and pre-Cambrian time, even really before life really existed. Um, however, our geologic understanding of Antarctica is really heavily limited by the ice cover. So 
there's a lot of time that's just missing and we have to work with the small bodies of rock that are exposed like in the dry valleys and in the Transantarctic Mountains and in the peninsula. So we went from the formation of the East Antarctic Craton. We talked about the great oxidation event and how cyanobacteria, the same microorganisms that made stromatolites, oxygenated the atmosphere um, and how we had snowball earth after that, the first ice age on earth in which Antarctica, as well as virtually the entire planet was covered in ice. Um, after snowball earth came to an end as a result of CO2 emissions from volcanoes, we had the Cambrian explosion when most modern groups of life evolved, when a lot of modern groups of phytoplankton first showed up, as well as when most of the broad groups of modern animals show up, like arthropods, mollusks, vertebrates, and cnidaria, the group that includes sponges and corals. They looked rather different than they do now. Um, arthropods, for example, include trilobites, which you see fossils of but don't see today because they've been extinct since the Permian extinction. But they're related to crabs and insects and spiders and other arthropods today. We skipped over a fair bit of time after the Cambrian explosion. We, you, but um, life began in the oceans. Cyanobacteria formed in the oceans. Um, the Cambrian explosion was an explosion of marine life. Land was not really colonized until you have some plants show up in the Silurian period on land. And then in the Devonian period, you start getting amphibians. That's followed by the Carboniferous period when we get large scale forests starting to cover the land for the first time. During the Carboniferous period, Antarctica, as well as much of the rest of the world, was covered by warm, steamy swamps that actually produce the coal that we find today. And the colder Permian period, in which for a second time Antarctica had glaciers, came after. And the Permian period was the first period of there being dominant land animals. The Permian period is at the end of the Paleozoic era and dinosaurs existed during the Mesozoic era. The Permian period is right before the dinosaur era and during that period Antarctica was mostly inhabited by mammal ancestors. But then the Permian extinction happened. Um, the Permian extinction was caused by massive volcanic eruptions, igniting coal from the preceding Carboniferous period and that causing runaway ocean acidification. Rather similar in many ways to the modern climate crisis. Dinosaurs evolved to take advantage of the gaps left behind by the Permian extinction. The Permian extinction drastically reduced the diversity of the mammal ancestors and really heavily affected marine life. The earth got warmer during the Triassic period, the glaciers disappeared and dinosaurs and other reptiles took advantage of that. Um, and Antarctica became, Antarctica, um, has been part of a number of different supercontinents over geologic history. It was part of Rodinia um, during Precambrian time. It became part of Gondwana or a collection of the southern continents for much of its history. And then at the start of the dinosaur era, Antarctica, as well as the rest of Gondwana, was joined with essentially all of the land on Earth as part of Pangaea. And the first Antarctic dinosaurs appear in the early Jurassic period um, with the first true mammal showing up around the same time. And we do have a few dinosaurs from Antarctica. We have a couple of species documented from the scant bits of Mesozoic era rocks that we have exposed in the peninsula and in the Transantarctic mountains. Um, dinosaurs actually did quite well in Antarctica, it seems though. Antarctica was attached to Australia for most of the Mesozoic and um, the, like the polar dinosaur communities that you saw in the Walking with Dinosaurs episode, you would likely have similar communities to those in Antarctica. Those dinosaurs are Australian, but Antarctica's ecosystem was really similar to that, most scientists think. Um, Pangaea began to break up during the dinosaur era, so that involved rifting, including the rifting open of the Atlantic Ocean, as well as the rifting of Antarctica from other parts of Gondwana. So like these these basalts, these volcanic rocks that you can see at the top here, those are actually giant lava flows from when Antarctica rifted apart from Africa, which was the first continent it actually broke off from. So at the same time as at the same time as Gondwana, as Pangaea and was starting to break up and as the southern continents began to drift apart, 
dinosaurs began to decline. Um, and they were almost completely wiped out by the asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous, and that led to mammals to thrive. We talked a little bit about the few land mammals we had in Antarctica, as well as some ancestors of penguins. Mammal, the land mammals of Antarctica would all die out when the last continents drifted away from Antarctica. And with the overall global climate being cooler with the, with the current ice age approaching, the death knell for Antarctica's land life was the opening of the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. The world was already a lot colder and the current isolating Antarctica caused it to be so cold that it became like it looks now, a bare, largely desolate place that's too cold for most land life. Penguins and a number of other marine mammals and birds survived. They adapted to, they adapted to the opening of the ACC. Um, so we went straight from geolo the geologic history into talking about what land life of Antarctica is left. So a possible question here links something we learned about during the geology unit to part of the carbon cycle today. And the question is, true or false, coal in Antarctica formed from vast swamps during the Carboniferous and Permian periods. This sequestered carbon dioxide by removing it from the atmosphere. So true or false, this, the coal forming sequestered carbon dioxide by removing it from the atmosphere. And this is here to make you think about the difference between what happens when humans burn fossil fuels compared to when fossil fuels are formed. And the answer is true, indeed. Forming fossil fuels actually takes CO2 out of the atmosphere, converts it into hydrocarbons, and buries it, essentially keeping it out of out of the cycle until it gets until it gets dug up by people, um, which is again a big reason why the current burning of fossil fuels is so concerning because we're doing this much faster than it really ever gets gets removed or dug up geologically, with a very few exceptions like the Permian extinction. So, any questions about fossil history of Antarctica before I talk a little bit about modern before Antarctica mod, modern ecology? Um, and I actually do see one question that I'll address. Um, in terms of there being dinosaurs that have been discovered but not named yet, most of them are, they belong to dinosaur clades that are known. So they found, they found some other long-necked dinosaurs. If you remember from um, Glacialosaurus, which was one of the long-necked early Jurassic dinosaurs, there was a diorama of it and there was a little long-necked dinosaur next to it that was a similarly, a similar dinosaur to it, but one that was smaller that hadn't been named yet. So they've found other meat eating dinosaurs. They found other long necks. They found, um, they have found some other armored dinosaurs. Um, the cool thing though, is that it's not always clear how closely they're related to other members of their groups or how they got there. Um, for example, um, Antarctopelta, which is, it is named. It's one of the armored dinosaurs. Um, it's not clear which animal, which it's not clear exactly what its closest relatives are, even though it's clearly an armored dinosaur, because most of those armored dinosaurs with clubs lived in the northern hemisphere, but Antarctopelta lived in the southern hemisphere. So it's kind of interesting to think about how it got there, what paths it might have migrated on, and whether there's whether there's other species it's closely related to that aren't known. So a bit of a broad answer, but I hope that helps you, but I hope that helps you understand a little bit. Um, and that raises a good point. There's a lot of dinosaurs and other other species from Antarctica from the fossil record that aren't known because they haven't been dug up. And then there's some that are known from such fragmentary fossils that they haven't been formally described or named. Now, the last point we went into was talking about the modern ecosystems of Antarctica. So terrestrial life in Antarctica more or less went extinct after the ACC formed. We have just a couple arthropods, water bears, AKA tardigrades, a few simple plants, and then some extremophiles like the bacteria that live at blood falls. But the marine food web is a lot more diverse. Um, in Antarctica, the autotrophs, or the organisms that photosynthesize and make their own food, are primarily the phytoplankton that drift in the water. And these microscopic algae spend the summer dormant, frozen in the sea ice or living underneath it. And this provides a winter food source for krill, um, for the crab-like organisms that form um, the main food source for whales, as well as for crab eater seals and most Antarctic fish. In the summer, the constant sunlight, as well as an excess of nutrients, causes a productivity boom in which the phytoplankton prol proliferate. And as a result of that, the krill population booms um, because the krill 
eat the algae, and then baleen whales, including some which specifically migrate to Antarctica for this, as well as fish and crab eater seals begin to eat the krill. Penguins and other seals feed on the fish, and then leopard seals and orcas prey on the penguins. And Antarctic marine productivity, especially during the summer, is pretty impressive. We actually have um, sec we actually have third level carnivores like the leopard seals and the orcas, which are feeding on animals, which also feed on animals. Um, ocean food webs tend to be more meat based than land food webs because the plants, so to speak, the phytoplankton are so small. But in Antarctica, we actually have a number of top predators that eat, that eat several layer, several levels up the food chain. Um, and in general, remember that the higher up the food chain you get, the more energy is lost. Only about 10% of energy is actually transferable from one trophic level to the next. And so it's a testament as to how productive the Antarctic oceans can be during the summer that we have killer whales and leopard seals eating meat that also eats meat. And we talked about some adaptations um, of different Antarctic marine creatures, like how fish have evolved glycerol proteins or become large, how a lot of Antarctica's bottom dwelling organisms have gotten large, um, how penguins stay warm by huddling and via their tripod stance and by their streamlined feathers and by having fat under their skin, um, which is something that whales and seals do as well. Um, we learned about the different types of whales, how some whales have these hair-like structures in their mouths called baleen to filter krill out, um, and how Waddell seals use echolocation or how they bounce sonar essentially to navigate and how they use magnetic compasses to tell where they are and how they retain extra oxygen by having hemoglobin in their blood, extra hemoglobin in their blood and being able to store oxygen in their muscles. So the sample question here is meant to test one of your preconceptions about Antarctic marine life. Um, so the question is, why are penguins not considered to be land animals? And the possible answers are, they breed at sea. They are descended from marine life. They feed at sea. They cannot fly or all of the above. So which one of these disqualifies penguins from being terrestrial animals? Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Silly mouse wheel. There we go. And it is actually C because for penguins, the food source is the ocean. They eat fish. They, they really have nothing to eat at all on the land. The only reason they really go on the land is because they haven't evolved a way to safely protect their babies in the water. And actually, for one thing, they they still have to lay eggs. They they haven't they haven't evolved um, they haven't evolved a way around that yet. Um, a side tangent: I once read a book called um, "After Man: a, a Zoology of the Future" that speculated the descendants of penguins 50 million years from now having evolved a way to retain the egg in their body and hatch it just right right when the animal's about to hatch, which is what snakes do actually. So who knows, this was a very speculative book, but it could happen. But for now, penguins have to lay eggs. And um, so penguins do breed on the land. So A would actually be ruled out because penguins do technically breed on land. B doesn't really apply because um, we are technically descended from marine life. Life came out of the oceans, but we are land animals um, because most of our food is land-based. And you can make an argument that yes, we eat fish sometimes, but by and large, humans rely on the land to feed. Um, the fact that penguins can't fly doesn't really matter. Ostriches can't fly, but they're considered land birds because they eat insects and grass and other things on land. So the answer is indeed C, because their food sources in the ocean, they're not, they're not terrestrial animals. And you wanna really remember that there's just not much land-based life left in Antarctica at all. The reason the penguins go on land, aside from not being able to lay eggs in the ocean, is that on land, there's no leopard seals and orcas to bother them. The land is very lifeless and harsh, and they kind of have to get around that by doing their rather intricate system of swapping whether the which parent is taking care of the penguins and which one is which which parent is taking care of the baby and which one is going back to the ocean to get more food. And remember, that's one part of the penguin migration, especially with emperor penguins. Um, they have to go back to the ocean to get food for their young. So remember that there's very little land-based life left in Antarctica. So any final questions before I close the review session? Um, a 
of course, there will be one more session of review on next Wednesday when I talk about the post midterm material. This isn't a completely exhaustive summary, but this gives you a sense of what topics from the first half of the course are important and what connections you might see with newer topics, I hope. Okay, so I will be sticking around for office hours until four. I'll be shutting the recording off now. And again, as always, good luck studying and let me know if you have any further questions. And yes, these slides are posted already. They're posted under the lecture um, 18 um, uh, folder. Can I ask what were you saying next week's uh, lecture is going to be? Yes, so Monday there's not going to be a lecture or office hours because it's Memorial Day. Then Wednesday I'm going to do a session like this, but it's going to cover everything that we've covered since the midterm. And the practice quiz will be open. I, thank you for the reminder. There will be a practice quiz meant to, meant to give you a sense of what kind of questions could show up on the final. And that will definitely be open by dead week, but I'm hoping to have it open within a day or so. So I'll send an email out once it's open. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I'll see you all next time. I'm going to shut the recording off.